our first first interviewee on this channel. Hey, dude, why don't you go ahead and state uh, what your name is, whatever you're comfortable with, and whereabouts that you're from. Okay. Uh, so everyone calls me Cheddar. Um, I'm from Long Beach in Los Angeles County, California. Uh, and yeah, man, I'm here to I'm here to talk to this guy. I really dig what he's doing, and it's good to hear another perspective from the other side of the fence, you know. Hell yeah, dude. So you were telling me that you were in the military prior to uh, being incarcerated. Is that accurate? Yeah, I was. Actually, um, fresh out of high school, I uh, I joined. I actually, fuck, it was a trip. I actually tried to join the Marines and um, fucking crayon eaters. Yeah, <laughs> all, dude. All of, them, all of my Marine brothers out there, but fucking crayon eaters. But I tried to, I tried to join the Marines and, uh, because when I was in high school, um, I was actually put on like ADD medication and shit. And so when I was recruited, I did it. My recruiter didn't tell me that like if I disclosed that, that I'd be excluded. Um, if you've ever taken like any type of like mind altering, like I, I forgot what it was that they that they do. I mean, you might know more than I do, but anything that you take like that, they exclude you. Well, at least at the time, I don't know about now. Um, you know what I mean? And uh, so, what it was is the recruiter was like, "Hey, bro, like you kind of got um, excluded from the army because." What was that? Oh, you were saying you got excluded? Oh yeah, yeah, I got like excluded from um, the Marines, and he told me he's like, "Look, bro." Um, cause I had already stopped taking that stuff years prior. So he told me, he was like, Hey, um, he was like, just tell the army that you never took it. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's like, we still do this and whatever. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, I ended up just going with the army and, um, I was in there for a couple of years, man. I, I was a combat engineer. I was stationed at Fort Leonard Wood, um, fresh out of, uh, um, AIT and everything like that. They put me in, uh, like basically the same, the same duty station where I did basic and AIT, you know, they just left me there and, uh, I got hurt in a training accident and they medically discharged me. And the thing is, is me coming from where I come from and the lifestyle that I come from, I saw the military as like a way out. And then when that happened, they like, even like, so you know how, like, when you go through maps and, like, everything would fly you out and they do all the whole nine yards, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, so like, I mean, when I got medically discharged and they sent me home from Fort Leonard Wood, I got a, I got a Greyhound on the way home, you know? So, it was, like, one of those things where you felt kind of like they just threw you aside. For sure, man. And that's unfortunate with the military. So you mean you tell me uh, you were living a certain type of lifestyle prior to you uh, going into the military? Was that the same lifestyle that you jumped right back into when you got back? Exactly. Exactly. And, and where did uh, where did that lead you to, man? Fucking okay. CDCR. <laughs> CDCR. Uh, uh, how long was your term for? Um, well, I've had a few. Um the first one was two years, and then the second one was four, um, and then the third one was three. But, I mean, as you know, there's percentages and stuff like that, so not 100%, you know? Right. And uh, what prisons did you touch down at? The, the thing is, is, like, I've gone all over the place due, due to the fact that, well... So first off, I mean, of course, you leave county and then you touch reception and everything like that. I was at reception. Fuck, I was in Delano for nine months. Nine months that term before I left to Stephenville, my first term. Uh, I got stuck there for a cool little minute. Uh, and then Susanville, the thing is, is I had a warrant. So I filed a 1381. See, the problem was that I was pissed because I was like, why the fuck wouldn't you guys tell me right away? Like, I even asked about it and everything. And they said, oh, no, you're fine. And then when I finally got the main line, they were like, 
oh no, you have a warrant. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I could have taken care of this months ago, you know? Yeah. So I filed a 1381. I'm there using bill for like a year. And they finally pull me down. So I have to go through the whole process. And I mean, if no one else knows, Susan Bill is all the way up in way northern California, past San Francisco. It's like an hour away from Reno, Nevada. You know, the only prison higher in California than that northern is Pelican Bay. So it's fucking far. Um, so I had to go through the whole process of doing layovers and getting dragged out. And during that process, I was stuck in Chino and Delano for multiple, like, I mean, a layover, I mean, for who, whoever doesn't know, it's supposed to be that, it's supposed to be overnight. You get there probably whatever time you get there, five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock at night, and then you stay there overnight and in the morning when the bus leaves, you leave with them. Uh, so I was supposed to only be there overnight, and the only prison that I actually had an overnight stay in was San Quentin. And at this time, San Quentin, this was like 2018 or so, um, San Quentin was already mostly 50. Um, so the thing is, like, even when I arrived there, it was a trip because, like, I've been GP for all of my terms. Um, when I pulled, I was GP. Uh, so the thing is, it's going through San Quentin, especially being from Los Angeles County, you don't typically go up there. Um, it's very rare that Hispanics from Southern California end up in San it was pretty much non So, going there was a trip first off, and then second off, with the whole 50 50 thing already going on. Yeah. We were, es- we were escorted everywhere that we went. When we went through San Quentin, they escorted us everywhere. So, it was a trip to go through a prison, especially having, this, having to be escorted through everything. Never having heard those, you know, when they yell escort and everything like that. Right. It was a trip. Never having heard that. And uh, real quick, I mean, whether you can or you can't speak on it, were you guys given instruction to to take flight on on the first dude you seen, or there was none of that kind of talk? Well, the thing is with that is that with everything going on, this was like late 2018, early 2019. So they didn't even we didn't even get a chance. They kept us. The, really, really far away from everyone. And even like the R&R workers when we got there, um, like when we had trades served to us when dinner time came around, the COs gave them to us. Um, we weren't allowed anywhere near them at all because that whole entire prison was 50, 50 at least. So even, yeah, there, was, there wasn't an opportunity for anything. Right. So out of, out of all the terms that you did, what would you say was probably your, your most violent encounter that you maybe observed or the wildest thing that you saw? Um, to keep it real, it was losing bill, which is surprising to some people, but it just depends on what's going on. But there was a lot going on there. And the thing is, is just with Susan Bill in general, there's a lot of fuckery that goes on there because a lot of, I mean, that's, I mean, for the people that don't know, Susan Bill usually is like the prerequisite fire camp. That's where they send you if you qualify to fire camp. Low level dudes, a lot of younger dudes, a lot of first termers people that might just be stupid. Better said, you know. Um, so I'd say probably about twenty eighteen when I was there, I was there on E Yard Air Yard, which is a level two um that yard there was a guy there and it, usually when it comes to this kind of stuff it's not really spoken of and the thing is that so the 
Native American. Uh, the natives, for those that don't know, are kind of like their own thing. They even do like how everyone else does paperwork checks. They do like heritage check to make sure that you're actually native. And they talk to your people and like all that. You know what I mean? They do like the whole process, which is basically to make sure that you're an, native, an actual Native American. Um, and there was a dude there who was claiming that he was Native American. And I guess he wasn't. And so for those that haven't been to James Town and Susanville, James Town and Susanville, that we call it the Motel State. Because the way that the dorms are set up every yard is set up, set up in a new fashion. But the buildings, it literally looks like a motel state. The different dorms. Um, they have two doors on each end of them, and then they have like windows that you can see through and stuff. Um, and they hold about 30 people, each one. So, when it comes down to those, um, what's the, the, the dorms? The dorms right there. In, the doors, the windows in the doors, there are like six different little glass panels around it, and then there's a hole in the middle that's an open, where a panel's supposed to be, but it's an open. Um, you can stick an arm through there, you can talk to somebody through there, or whatever. So I guess this dude had claimed that he was a native. Everything checked out that it was that he was a native. Uh, so these dudes very corner in the bottom tier of that yard these dudes basically there's a corner dorm where from the towers there's only like one tower that has visibility of that area and they're very far away they're on the other side of the yard so that was like the go to zone that was the hot zone you know um, and so basically what these dudes did was like one of the most vicious like actions that I've ever seen in a way because I saw the whole thing from the dorm at the top because this happened at the bottom. So it happened during child release. And the way that they do that on that yard is they start from the bottom tier of one end and then they go up, you know. Uh, so I was on the top tier, so we hadn't even been, you know, door unlocked yet. And I'm there, and the native dude, they're all walking, you know, people walk in their groups and shit around the track to the child hall. So... Somebody called him over to one of the dorms that hadn't been unlocked yet through the window. Like, hey, man, come here. Dude comes. They fucking shake his hand through the door. And the guy that shakes his hand through the door yanks his arm through the fucking door. They hold him there. And, like, four more dudes come up behind him and fucking blast the shit out of him. Like, fucking four dudes deep blast the shit out of him. Fucking, I don't even know how many times. There was blood everywhere. The dude tried to take up because over there in Susanville, because it snows most of the year, they give us these big, heavy snow jackets. Um, down south, they give you, like, the jean jackets, the CDCR jackets, but up north over there, they give you these big orange ones with, like, sheepskin on the inside. Uh, and fucking dude's jacket, the orange jacket, just turned red. Fucking dude went running for the program office. You know? It was a blood battle. Like, it was crazy. But just the... You know what I mean? That's a reality check to remember where you're at, you know? Because it's like, especially the whole, like, handshake through the window type shit. You know what I mean? That That's what I'm talking about, dude. It's like, nothing really is black and white or cut and dry, man. I mean, you people talk about stabbings on prisons. And, and you just mentioning that just goes to show you the whole level of viciousness, man. The whole hand through the window shit has to have been planned out methodically, dude. And that, that's crazy. No, I know, like, that's the thing. Um, like, when it comes to shit like that, it's just fucking insane. Like, like I mean, this, there was probably another time. Like, so, the thing is, I spent a lot of time at Susan there for years. And I went up and down because there, they have four different yards. They have Sierra Yard. Um, they have Cascade Yard which are the, like, one and two yards that are the prerequisite for fire camp. And then 
they have fuck, what was the because I, I never went to fire camp, but they have a yard, oh Arnold Yard, called Arnold Yard, where they send you once you get endorsed to fire camp and you go train to be a firefighter and then they send you to the camp. Um, but they also have a three yard there that's called Lassing Yard. So basically Lassing Yard is all the fuck up for everyone that keeps getting C status, keeps getting write ups, keeps getting your points points boosted and everything like that. And then you know, they eventually hit level three A and then they get sent up. So I spent a lot of time on last year. And there was there was a guy there. So okay, so the the reasoning behind this I can't really get into it, but he was a northern Hispanic. And basically with with them, once you're done they're going to try to kill you, you know, they're going to try to end you, they're not going to, they're not going to play any games with you, and so basically, dude's career was over, um, that's all I can get into with that, is his career was over, and so in the 270 blocks, they have the two stairwells, you know, that lead to the top tier, they angle in on A side and B side, right, um, he was sitting on the stairs, putting his shoes on, like, retying one of his laces, and I guess he had like a towel rolled up like a rat tail underneath his fucking grave and shit like that. And knew that they were supposed to kill him because they fucking, it, I mean, you know how the sides work, but it's like under A side, he had to go underneath the stairs so he couldn't walk into other people's area. Um, so he walked underneath the stairs and dude with the towel whipped out and fucking loosed him from underneath the stairs and he aped it up. And meanwhile, while that's happening, once he gets that full yank and starts tying it to the stairs and shit, just pulling up and everything, the, the other dudes come in and fucking do what they do. You know, and they fire a warning shot off and everything in the cell block and everything like that. And they, but just fucking seeing dude hang there after because the guy had taken the towel. Well, I guess he had like two of them tied up or a sheet. It, it was something. It was white. Because I was in my cell. You know, this was bottom tier. Fucking day room and shit. So I was in my cell and you just saw a dude hanging there, you know. Like afterwards and you're just like, fuck, man. It, like just the amount of fucking craziness that goes along with that shit. You know, do you know that dude ended up dying or not, or can't speak on that? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. no, he, he, it was all bad. It was all bad? Yeah, it was all bad. They, I mean, they brought in the, the fucking med lift and everything, they, they brought in the chopper and everything. Like that. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, even though it's just so far, bro, like, I mean, that's why, like, High Desert across the street has so many fatalities, because it's like, even if they fucking get the medevac in, it's like, it's over with. Right. Yeah. Fuck, I mean, dude. That shit's intense, man. Just hearing your hearing those two stories, dude. Um, well, and I mean, it's just also like the the normalcy that comes with it. You know what I mean? Like, right. Somebody is sick of injury that they're like, holy fuck, what the fuck? But then to us, we're like, it's just another day in there, and then we don't say nothing. You know what I mean? I hear you. Come back the next day, you saw something high that you should know. Yeah, you mentioned normalcy. You mentioned normalcy, man, but I can assure you that's anything but normal, dude. And that's coming from both sides of the house, both sides of the fence. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I know. And, and I mean, that's the thing is after this last year, I got out, like, the, the amount of thinking I did, everything that I, you know what I mean? Like, I, I find a realization of, like, this is not it, bro. This shit ain't it. Yeah, you're in that, you're in that constant uh, fight or flight, um, uh, moment, bro, and that shit fucking takes its toll. Well, yeah, and that's the thing is, like, there's a quote, I don't know who said it, but it's like, to anybody that romanticizes war, conflict, and violence has never truly lived through. <laughs> Before you finish saying that, man, I had already finished what you were gonna say, dude. The people that want war... I've never experienced it because at one point I wanted war, bro. I'm getting fucking chills just thinking about that. Nah, I know, and that's the thing is, like, me being on both sides of that, you know what I mean? Like, I, I was in the military and, like, coming, coming to 
coming out to that and having that fucked up mindset and then going into something that's almost like the same, you know? Right. And it will, in, in, in certain ways, it's almost the same. So it's like, it, it doesn't shift. You know, your mind stays in that same fucking place, just in darker ways. For sure. Well, as you know, dude, on my channel, I'm all about promoting that positivity, dude. So I encourage you to uh, reach out for any of, of help that you may need regarding those past experiences and anybody else listening. Um, as we, there, There's nothing weak about that, dude. And, and that's coming from a guy that's reached out for plenty of help. Oh, no. Nah. Like, like, that's the thing. Is this whole term, I spent, I spent my time in, in programs, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I actually dived deep into myself as a man and figured out what the fuck was going on with myself. Right. What my, what my problems were. You know what I mean? Like, why, why was I active? Why did I have this, like, why? And then figuring that out and destroying that mindset. Like, fuck that. For sure, dude. If, uh, there's anything that you can say to our viewers, anything positive, anything to these youngsters that are glo are glamorized by that gang life, what would you say? So, basically, it's like, it's like look, man, all of this stuff, they glamorize it in movies. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, I mean, I had some of the best times in my life. You know what I mean? But when you break it down and you really look at things, the amount of looking over it's like my wife. She told me she's like, the best money you'll ever make is clocking in and clocking out of work. Because I've had hundreds of thousands of dollars I spoke over my whole life. I've had so much money I didn't even know what to do with it, but I always had to look over my fucking children. Yeah, dude. I never, I never had peace of mind. I never had true happiness. And right now I'm working I'm fucking working a minimum wage job at 40 hours a week and I've never been happier in my whole fucking life. <laughs> I hear you, man. I'm making fucking $19 an hour right now, bro, and I'm so happy. Like, that's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? Like, it's just the... the I, I get to come home to my, my wife. I get to come home to my home that I pay for it and I pay with taxes. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that shit fucking sucks, son. You know how good it felt to have a fucking, you know, I mean, a Mercedes with all this jewelry and shit, and like, and just have all this cash in my pocket, but it's like, at what cost? I almost did life over all that shit. For sure, dude. At what cost? But, um, all right, we're going to wrap it up, dude. I thank you. I thank you for, you know, for that opportunity to allow you to uh, share your story on this channel, man. You were the first one, dude. You, uh, you're it, man. <laughs> That's right, dude. All right, I'm going to close out this video, but stay on the line, bro. All right, fellas, you heard it here first, man. First interview. Crazy stories. Crazy. And it's the truth. You can hear it in the dude's voice. All right? Keep pushing forward.